few days ago, I had a guy bring me in a 1909 West Point cadet jacket. Being that the jacket is 100 years old and it belonged to a famous Nevada general, that's huge. I want to buy it, but I have to have it authenticated first. So I told the seller to meet me at the Clark County Museum so we could meet with my buddy Mark. He is an expert on American military. Sit down, please. This is the infamous jacket uh, I told you about. Ah, yes. I'm looking forward to this. I'm the administrator for the Clark County Museum System, which means I run the three museums that are operated by Clark County, Nevada. Now, do you mind if I no, open no, these no. up and take a look? No, go ahead. What's interesting is not just that it's a West Point jacket, but it's, it was a man who made quite a career in the military. He became a lieutenant general, which is quite high in the military, and he was a Nevada native. This is a very unusual thing. As I'm looking at areas like the buttonholes here, the way that those are lined, you know, the, the way the stitching is done, all of that seems correct to me. This, this has been added on, and that's probably a later piece. You can see that it's, it's a different kind of fabric. It's not the same fabric as here. It's been added on. Probably the original one got torn. It's not wrong in that it, it shouldn't be on there, it's, but it's a later addition to the jacket. And this is very typical. This, when you look at the sleeves, this, this striped lining, Mm -hmm. Very typical. It's it's a very typical material at the turn of the century. The wear seems correct. Yeah. And this would have gotten a lot of wear because in West Point she would have worn this a lot. I mean, I, I know what you can do if you want to fake something. I see nothing on here that tells me that that's been done. So if, if this was offered to me, I would take it for the museum. Looks right to the time period. The insignia is right. The, the construction is right. The materials are right. I think you've got a very, very nice piece here. Thank you. And, and just a, a wonderful coat. I've dealt with a lot of uniforms over the years in many museum collections. And it was very nice seeing one that is from that time period in that kind of condition, because it's very good condition, and was right. So in your personal opinion, what do you think it's worth? I can speak to whether it's real or not. I can tell you what I know about it, but you know I can't tell you anything on the value. You can check that on your own. I've been trying to get prices out of him for years. He won't give them, period. He just tells you if it's real. Okay. And uh, that's why I come and see him. But thanks, Thank man. you. I really, really, really appreciate I, it. I appreciate you bringing it by. Thank you, Phil, for coming in. Thank I you appreciate for taking a look at my uniform. The moment Mark said it was real, I knew I had to have it. The question was, is how much can I pay for it and still make a profit? All right, so we know it's real now, so give me my money. Okay, yeah, well, let's negotiate. Okay. <laughs> I'm here at the pawn shop uh, for the last time, I hope, and I uh, want to get down to the negotiations of the uh, Griswold uh, tunic. Now that we both know the jacket is real, we got to come up with a price. A few days ago, he came in and he wanted $3,500, but I got to get the jacket for much less. So, um, hey, man, the big question, what do you want for it? $8,500. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I want for it, but uh, as far as what's reasonable, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd probably go uh, around in the 3500 price range on it. It's really, really cool, but it's so hard to price things when there's only one of them. This jacket is probably one of the most uh, significant historical items you can have in your store. It has a name behind it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a really, really high-end piece. I mean, there, there's nothing you have here that I've seen that comes close to what, what this would do for your store to have, have this kind of quality in your showcase. I got to make money, and I just don't know if I can on it. That's, that's the problem. You I mean, literally, I think I'd buy it for 1500 bucks. How about, uh, how about 15 cash and 12, 12 in trade? That I can, I go 1500 cash. You know, I mean, I don't mean to beat you up, yeah, yeah. but it just, everything scares me to death. I'm getting 50% of what I was getting for diamonds. I'm getting... Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the prices have dropped that much on everything. Well, give me some trade. Give me something. I want to buy something from your store. Give me 15 cash and five trade. Okay, deal. Sounds good. Yeah. We did get a deal. We did get a deal. Okay. All right, it's cool, because I didn't think we were going to be able to make a deal. Yep, well... I'm happy with the deal. He, he bought the jacket, and uh, I got some cash, and I get to go on a shopping spree. Hey, how's it going, man? What's up? Surprise, surprise, Mr. T. I pity the fool. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, this is cool. We have the Mr. T Snoopy. We got the talking Mr. T. Comes with a full tool kit. I didn't know uh, Mr. T was a mechanic. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
I love Mr. T because he was the first gangster like on a weekly series. Plus, I thought it was dope how he used to rock all the chains. I want to sell them because I grew up. I want 300. The least I take for him, I don't know. We can negotiate maybe 150. So you're a Mr. T fan or? Who wasn't a Mr. T fan? That's a legend right there. He's famous for being on the A team and everyone knows what a badass he was. Yeah, I mean, his real name is like Lawrence Tarot. I know he was a college football player that got expelled his first year. He ends up getting a job as a doorman in Chicago. And then his reputation kind of got him a job as a celebrity bodyguard. He meets Sylvester Stallone, who cast him in Rocky III. That was just his catapult into everything else. I mean, he had cartoon shows. He was a professional wrestler, A-team. The list goes on and on. So where'd you get this stuff? Actually, um, I grew up watching him. He was the first one in the hood with the Mohawks, so we thought it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> My little cousin, she had this one. But these two I had since I was a little boy. OK. Mr. T is one of those immediately recognizable icons from the 80s. And this guy's collection is awesome. But I just don't know how to put a value on him. Any idea of how much you want, or? Uh, three? 300? $300? One, two, three, one, two, three. Damn, $100. All right, I have no idea what this stuff is worth, my man. I'll tell you what, man, let me get a buddy of mine down here who kind of specializes in this stuff. I don't want to make you an offer without knowing exactly what it's worth. OK. All right, let me give him a call, and I'll be right back. He can call in his expert. That ain't nothing but more money in my pocket, you heard? A guy came in looking to sell his Mr. T-Dolls. He was huge in the 1980s, so they're definitely worth something. I just don't know how much. So I have Johnny coming down to tell me what they're worth. Mr. T? Cool. You couldn't have had the 80s without Mr. T. I mean, he was my hero. I mean, to have this back then, I mean, you're a pretty cool kid. Did everyone wear this much gold in the 80s? <laughs> it was a big thing, man. The story was he was a bouncer, and people that acted up, he took their chains and accumulated all these necklaces. And he wasn't a guy you messed with, of course. You know he was the man Anytime you got Snoopy wearing gold chains. I don't think there's a cooler Snoopy out there than the Mr. T Snoopy. Mr. T still has a huge nostalgic factor for any kid that grew up in the 1980s. So in the collectible world, who wouldn't want to have it? He wants 300 for all of it. What's this stuff worth? All right, well, he looks in pretty good shape. I mean, he's missing his weapons, of course. The Snoopy here looks like maybe the sun changed his color some. But overall, it's pretty clean. For the talking Mr. T, we have the box here. We've got all the accessories. As a group, you're probably looking at 275 for everything. OK. That's all I needed to know, man. Appreciate cool, it. Cool, man. My favorite decade of toys was the 1980s. Anytime you come in and see some cool stuff to bring me back to my childhood, it's win-win for me every day. Damn, I'm good. What did that man tell you? It doesn't matter, because I'm only going to offer you 100 bucks. Huh? That's the magical Mr. T. <laughs> come on, man. You know I got to make money off of it. We can't go a little bit high. I mean, how about 140? When in the world are you ever going to see a gangster Snoopy with the gold chains on, homie? I'll give you $110. Uh, 115 We got a deal. 115 All right, dude. 115 You win. Jump right this guy up. All right. Come on. Hey, $115. That's cool, because really, at this age, what am I going to do with a Mr. T dog? Ooh, we got to sew Mr. T. Earlier, a guy brought in an old Gibson banjo. These things can go for a lot of money, especially in good condition like this one. But I have no idea what it's worth, so I called my buddy Jesse down to take a look. Hey, Jesse, don't quit your day job. <laughs> right, I know, right? <laughs> You know, a lot of people don't know, this is American. This is pretty much our instrument. This was actually really brought into the States and popularized in the early days by, by slaves, believe it or not. Wow. This is quintessential 20s. It's got the cool inlays. Uh, it's not extremely fancy. You've got the nice bridge setup. You've got the Grover tuners, which were the higher end tuner. These actually are original to the instrument. They don't slip all that much. A lot of banjos are held in just by a peg pushed through there. Everything on it appears to be original. And it's in decent shape. Let's open it up and get an exact gear and make sure there's nothing screwy going on underneath here, you know? Okay. All right, let's see. You got the cool 
old Gibson decal in there. Okay. All right. And the serial number says? It is 8086-1. The this serial number series starts in 1925 at 8,000, so it's 1925. Okay. What's the damn thing worth? Well, I've seen some of the master tones go all the way up to ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Wow. Okay. But this is the TB3. This is the beginning of the line. It's a professional one, but it's lower in professional. It, it's, it's for the professional guy that goes out and plays, but isn't, a, you know, making a ton of money. A 1925 TB3, probably a good strong nine condition. It's in good shape. I'd probably say... about 24, 2500 in this condition. I was thinking a little more. I did a little research on the internet, and the most expensive one I saw was like $5,000. It was probably like a four, five, or six. It probably had a little bit different inlay on the headstock and on the fingerboard. Thanks, Jesse. You're the best, no man. Thank hey, you. Jesse. All right. You know, after looking at it and seeing the condition of the banjo, I don't think it would be too hard for them to get $2,500 for it on the open market, because it is a pretty clean original piece. I know you originally wanted five grand, but that's not gonna happen. But I'll give you $1,500 for it. I was hoping for 2,000. I, I can't go 2,000 bucks on it. I gotta make money on it. And, you know, I'm assuming I'll get 2,500 bucks for it. How about 1,800? I'll tell you what, I'll split the difference with you 1,650, and that's the best we can do. Okay, 1650. All right, it's a deal. Thank you, sir. I made sixteen fifty on my banjo today, and I'm going to give the money to my mother and father uh, so that they can enjoy it. I got this uh, old pocket watch I'd like for you to look at, see if you might be interested in. Okay. That's really, really cool. You want a few Zias? No. Okay. Uh, really interesting watch. Can you teach me about watches not in front of the customer? <laughs> I come down to the pawn shop today to sell my old antique Fusey pocket watch. This watch is awesome because it was all handmade, the complete thing. I'd like to sell today because it's my hobby. I buy and sell watches. So do you know much about it? It's a Fusey from late 1700s. Isaac Rogers is a maker. His name is on the dial and also on the back. When they wind it up, instead of using gears, it looks like a miniature little bicycle chain. OK, as a matter of fact, these chains are so small, they used to have little kids put them together because their eyesight was good enough and their hands were so small. And it's running. And the movement is pretty. It was probably one of the most complicated miniature machines made, because every gear in old fusees is hand cut. Literally, a guy had a little piece of metal and had, with a little file had to cut every gear. Back in the 1700s, they didn't mass produce watch parts like they do today. Almost every single piece had to be meticulously handmade. So watches were extremely expensive. Definitely a status symbol. You know, with antiques, a lot of times it's really hard to date them. But the great thing is, it was the law in England that they had to have the date on them. This mark right here, the, the lion, tells me that it's sterling silver. This one right here, which is a crowned leopard, means it was made in London. And this date code right here tells me it was made in I actually have an app that tells me the date code because the code's really weird. Oh, really? You have an app? Yes, I have an app. I'm, I'm getting technologically advanced like you kids. And there it is, 1772. Cool. A 240-year-old item like this is going to interest a lot of people. The problem is the watch movement, the whole system inside the watch, is much prettier than the watch itself. How much you want for it? I'd like to get 1000 bucks out of it. That's not going to happen. Old English watches like this really all depend on the way the case is made. It's how pretty it is. And this is a pretty plain case. Um, I'd give you like 400 bucks for it. 400, man, I can't sell that for 400 bucks. I don't understand why they go for so little. You would think they would go for more. How about 700? I'll go 450. I'll tell you what, you make it five and it's yours. All right, 500. All right, you want to write them up some? Yeah, that's good. Some paperwork in there. I feel that I didn't get what I really should have got out of the watch, but I understand they got to make money also, so I can live with it.
Hey, how can I help you? Got an old Swedish carriage strong box. Where in the world did you get this? Found it at a farm auction in Sweden, actually. So what were you doing in Sweden? Chasing blondes. <laughs> <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my 1787 carriage trunk. I've had it for 10 years, and I'm just tired of looking at it, figure to see if I can sell it and get some money for it. I paid almost $800 for it. I'd like to get that out of it. So do you know anything about it? It's called a fad screen in Swedish. They were the strong box for their day. You put it on the back of a carriage. It does look the period. It's the right kind of metal work. They made them out of iron. They had steel back then, but it was a good 20 or 30 times as much as iron. It looks like someone upper middle class would have bought this thing. Back in the day, people traveling by horse and carriage had to deal with highway robbers, even in Sweden. So to keep people from messing with their stuff, they kept their valuables in a strong box. It was basically one step below a safe. That steamed wood. They'd use a steam box and lay the wood in there to make it really, really mm -hmm. bendable. Flexible. And then they would put it around a mold. Hand hammered rivets. They would make the rivets and then they would hammer them cold. You can't hammer them hot in something like this, otherwise it'll burn right through. Burns right through. This strong box is really cool. It looks like something you would see strapped to a stagecoach in the Old West. The only thing that's got me a little cautious, it's Swedish. And people don't collect a lot of things from Sweden. OK, now how much you want for it? I'd like to get the 800 back that I've got into it. I would have paid you that years ago. Um, the market has changed these days. I understand that. You know, I'm thinking like 400 bucks. We're in the United States. People like to collect stuff from the United States. It's just sort of the way things are. Um, Could you do six? Looks like an old pine trunk, son. Do three. <laughs> No offense, but this is the age that it is, and it's a rare piece. Can we settle at five? Yeah, I'll do 500. OK. It's yours. All right, um, I'll meet you right up front. We got to do some paperwork. I feel bad the guy lost money on this deal. But you know what? I don't feel that bad. The store's got to make money. Earlier, a guy brought in a collection of stuff signed by Orville Wright. It's a really exciting find, and I hope it's all legit. So I invited my buddy Drew down to take a look. So is this the Orville Wright collection or alleged Orville Wright collection? I'm a forensic document examiner, so it's who done it every day. Very fascinating work. Well, Orville Wright, as you probably know, is the first man to ever fly. But what's really fascinating is it really went like 120 feet the first wow. flight. It was like baby steps in the beginning. Uh, a couple years later, they built another prototype, and they were able to fly like over 20 miles. So, But oh. uh, it was one little step at a time. It's yeah. a fascinating story all the way around. So what do you think of the signatures? Well, we're going to have to take a closer look. Orville Wright's signature is very valuable. Excellent. We're dealing with eight different documents and eight different signatures. I've never seen that before, so it's a very unique collection. All right, one thing we definitely want to look for is the different pressure, you know, from lighter to darker. That usually indicates uh, that it's been written by hand. Uh, pressure is light to dark. That's what we want to see. Yeah. Let's really uh, break down the signature, OK? Uh, in the capital O, we're always looking for, it looks more like a D than, than like an O. And there's a combination of the V and the I that uh, I always want to see, because that's always consistent. Well, we're moving over to the uh, licenses here. OK. It's awfully light in ink. Well, I don't know. You put the evidence together. And... I'm impressed. This whole thing is good. Yes. <laughs> this whole thing. It's fantastic, really. Excellent. Sweet. What do you think it's worth? I'm telling you, I'm not kidding around. Retail-wise, all together, at least $15,000. Yes, you are the man. <laughs> When he told me that the retail value was 15000 I started thinking about all the good things I could do with that money. Thanks, Drew. All right, guys. Thanks for calling me in. Thanks a lot, Take buddy. care. Sure, Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So how much do you want for all this stuff? He said 15, didn't he? Conservatively. Uh, no, no, that's 15 retail. That's what people ask. I think Drew's figure might have been a little bit high. I will give you $3,000 for this stuff. Retail's really, it's all over the place. Really fancy galleries can charge really huge numbers. And, you know, I'm pawn shop downtown. By the time I sell it, it'll be seven or $8,000. But remember, I'm going to have a lot of time, effort. It's got to be framed. I understand the retail part of it. Yeah. And that you've got to make money. I'm looking at five. That's like a third of the retail. 
I mean, how, long, how much does it cost to frame something? It's not only that. I mean, it, there's a whole process involved. I'm paying an employee every time he shows this to a customer and they don't buy it. Why don't we shake hands on four? <sighs> Literally, you could get this stuff at auction for like $4,000. OK, basically, you're at $3,000. I'm at $4,000. Why don't we just make a deal at 35? All right, 32. 33. Deal. All right, good enough. All right, write them up, son. Go do some paperwork, my man. The Wright brothers are actually heroes of mine, so having this collection in my store is really cool. What a find. Earlier, a guy brought in a cool painting signed by Leroy Neiman. I'm not really sure how valuable it is, so I called my buddy down to come check it out. Fred, what's going on, man? Gentlemen, how you doing? The guys usually call me down here when they have a question about a particular piece, either value-wise or authenticity-wise, or just want to find out a little bit more about its history. What can you tell me about it? Leroy Neiman, very distinctive style. He was kind of the artistic equivalent of Ernest Hemingway. You know, he's a man's man. He depicts a lot of heroic action. He used to have a expression, fast brush strokes make for fast action real bold, bright, vibrant colors and a lot of flow, and that's really what he was renowned for. Leroy Neiman's probably the most famous American artist living today. He became popular in the 60s. He was doing work with Playboy. He was at all the Super Bowls, all the major, you know, fights, and he became almost as famous as the athletes that he drew uh, images of. Do you have any particular concerns that you wanted me to take a look at? For some reason, I just feel like it should have been signed up there instead of down below like that. That is a little interesting, because usually you'll have the printed signature somewhere within the image. However, in looking at the, the print, the signature is not separate. It's all one sheet of paper. Okay. With, with serographs, you'll get kind of a layered look. So it almost looks like there's okay. a separate sheet of paper on top of it. But it's all <laughs> part of the same piece. You're right. So I don't think we have to worry about authenticity or anything like that with this work. Okay. Now, we do have some issues condition-wise. You look how discolored the margins are. and See how off-white and yellow it is here? That's a real concern in ter determining the value of this particular piece. All right. Just kind of give me an idea of what it's worth. I would say, based on the condition that it's in, I would probably put a value on it around $1,200. Ah, uh, not exactly what I was hoping for. That's about as, as high as I can do on it, I think. Appreciate it, hey, man. Thanks Corey, a lot, man. My pleasure. Initially, things were sounding very good until he started to get to the condition and just how much that condition affected the cost. I got to make money, too. I would offer you around $800 for it. It's not like I'm making a huge amount of money here, man. The condition's just rough. Well, I understand that you've got to make money on it, and if $1,200 is a value, I'm disappointed in the value. I think your your offer is is fair. So, um... all right, my man, I appreciate it. I offered this guy a fair price, and he took it. Even though the condition's not great, there's so many Leroy Neiman fans out there. I know I can sell it. Earlier, a guy brought in a baseball bat from the early 1900s that's supposedly related to Shoeless Joe Jackson. I'm not sure if it's real or even valuable, so I called in my sports expert Jeremy to come in and check it out. Jeremy, what's going on, man? Corey, how's it going, man? So, what'd you find this time? Uh, it's a Spalding Black Betsy. Okay. The guys call me down to the shop anytime they have a question about a piece of sports memorabilia that they need some more information about. Shoeless Joe Jackson was widely considered one of the most natural hitters ever to play the game, and he even still ranks third all-time in batting average. He was so good that actually Babe Ruth modeled his stance after him and regarded him as the best hitter he'd ever seen. Wow. An old fan carved the bat out of a piece of hickory wood. They used tobacco juice to stain it, hence the name Black Betsy. The bat became so famous that the original Black Betsy sold for nearly $600,000. That's a lot of money. This may not be the original Black Betsy that was owned by Joe Jackson, but manufactured bats of the all-time greats from this era are extremely collectible. OK, we do see the Spalding model, Black Betsy, right there. And we have the logo, Mark. We should see right here on the bat knob. Again, we do see Spalding's trademark. Okay. Based on the markings, this dimension, size, and everything, this bat is actually an authentic store model bat from around 1915 through 1920. All right. Yeah. Now, as far as the value of it, we do have some condition issues here. The decal right here, there's a lot of paint missing. Then we can also see right here on the bottom, we have initials AM inscribed. Given the condition, I would value this bat 
at $800. 800 bucks, huh? Yeah. Right on, my man. I appreciate you coming in. You got it, Corey. Thank you. Seeing a bat that's modeled after Black Betsy from Joe Jackson is truly an amazing find. Well, my man, this is definitely one of those times where calling in a buddy of mine kind of screwed me. Um, <laughs> I'll definitely give you your 300 bucks for it. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because he mentioned it could go for as high as 800, right? Yeah, man, but I still have to sell it, and I still have to find someone that wants to buy it. All right, so we're at 400, is that correct? Yeah, I told you I'd pay you 300 oh, for it, 300. so you're asking me for 400 now. Sure, why not? 400 is a nice price. That way you make money, I make money, everyone's happy. Split the difference with me, go 350. 350. Okay. All right, deal, man. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm really glad the experts showed up because I'm walking out with more money that way.